Welcome to this BGSS webinar as part of Leeds Digital Festival. Uh, it's the awesome Design Thinking Dad, um, which we've run previously. Uh, for those who don't know who BGSS is, we're the UK's leading privately owned technology consultancy. We've got offices around the UK and America. Um, this evening's session is going to be recorded and there'll be plenty of time at the end to go through any questions that you might have but please do submit them as we're going along using the chat or Q&A functionality. So without further ado I'd like to hand you over to our presenters for this session. So Rebecca and Paul of Spark, thanks very much. Hi everyone, uh, it's great to see so many people uh, dialing into this virtual Lead Digital Festival event. Um, today is the first of our Spark series, so we have Paul Bailey uh, presenting Design Thinking Dad. I've seen the talk and it's excellent, so I can't wait for you all to watch it as well. Um, Paul is a service designer in Spark, so he has skills varying from UX, research, service design, uh, you name it, he's very T-shaped. Um, and just to give you a bit of a background of who Spark are, Spark are the design consultancy um, arm of BGSS. So we help BGSS build user-centered products through doing UX research and following the end-to-end -end design uh, process. So without further ado, uh, I'll hand over to Paul and we will ask questions at the end. So if you do have any questions, just as Karen said, please pop them in the Q&A section or the chat functionality and we will come back to them at the end. So over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, my name is Paul Bailey, also known as Design Thinking Dad. Uh, and over the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to share with you a journey of transformation that I've been on over the last couple of years. And I'm going to explain why I take my work home and why you should too. And I'm going to share some design thinking mindsets with you, which will hopefully help you survive lockdown without losing the plot. But first, before we make a start, uh, I would like to offer you the chance to win an awesome thing. Uh, so this is a really brilliant book by a guy called Tim Brown, uh, who's one of the real uh, people at the forefront of design thinking. He oversees a really amazing company called IDEO, and he wrote this book, Change by Design, a few years ago. And you can win a copy of it. All you've got to do uh, is tweet Paul Bailey, uh, Design Thinking Dad, Leeds Digi20 and Spark. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll select a winner at the end of the presentation uh, and I'll make sure that a copy of this book gets sent directly to you. So let's start with a little bit of context. Uh, I don't know if you can all use your messaging facility but I'd be interested to know how many of you are designers out there. Uh, this is a, a, a typographic sculpture I would call it uh, and if you are a designer you can understand why I might have had a few words with my kids about their kerning skills. Uh, but it sits quite proudly on my bookshelf in the house. Uh, I've been in design now for over 20 years. I graduated in 98, wow, more than 20 years. Uh, I've been a junior designer, a digital designer, a senior digital designer, a design ops manager, a senior manager, uh, and now I'm a design consultant for Spark. Uh, but that only occupies my time during the working day. The other 128 hours uh, of the week is taken up by my real job, which is that have been a parent. Uh, so just out of interest, I wonder how many, how many, how many parents do we have out there? Uh, and again, you want to use the, uh, the chat channel on there just to give me an indication. I'd be interested if you could just to raise your hand if you've got uh, maybe one, one child or give me an indication if you've got two. Uh, two is actually above the national average now. In the UK, the national average is 1.9. So if you've got two, you kind of, you know, you've gone beyond that. Uh, don't worry if you're not a parent. I'm not going to talk about kids for the next hour. Uh, I'm just trying to get the kids stuff out of the way. It just so happens that my kids are my biggest pain point. So I'm going to be focusing a little bit on, on uh, what I do with them. So let's talk about parenting. Let's get this stuff out of the way. Uh, this is me uh, learning that too much broccoli can actually be uh, a bad thing. Uh, and parenting, parenting is tough, you know. Uh, this, in the early days, you've got to try and find out how they work. Uh, you really don't know what you're doing. Uh, lots of people are willing to give you advice, most of which doesn't really apply to your child. You suddenly find you're on 24 hour call, seven days a week, can't leave the house without a checklist and a 30 minute warning. 
uh, you don't know how to feed it, you don't know how to make it sleep, how to stop it weighing in your face when you try and change its nappy. Uh, and all of this whilst you're suffering kind of ex extreme sleep deprivation. Uh, and in my case, mourning the loss of your man cave. Uh, I, I listened to an interview recently with Charlie Brooker, uh, and he said that uh, having children ruins your life in the best possible way. And that kind of really sums it up for me. But at the same time, being a parent is awesome. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got four kids. Uh, the usual uh, reaction to that is first kind of shock, four, uh, and then confusion, really. Uh, but having four kids is amazing. Uh, and you can see my four kids are all at different stages. Uh, so I've got version uh, 0.4, which is in kind of a discovery phase. We're trying to figure out his user needs. Uh, whilst I've got version 0.1 that's in a public beta, uh, and he's kind of, we pretty much know what he needs, but we recently find out I'm tied up into a lifelong maintenance contract, uh, which is quite expensive. But this is back to the journey. That's the kid stuff. Let's get the kid stuff out of the way. This is me today uh, on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, you go, yay. Uh, actually, he's probably got better hair than me, that guy. Uh, but I want to talk to you about the journey that I've been on probably it's over the last three years now when I was thinking about it the other day. Uh, and there are a number of different events on that journey, uh, but it kind of starts in a way back in June uh, in 2018, uh, where the idea for this talk emerged. And it was quite a specific date and time. And I know what you're thinking. Uh, Paul, you're a sleep deprived dad. How can you remember that this date and this time? Well, something really unusual happened on this day uh, at this time. I'm just in bed waking up uh, and I'm kind of bleary eyed. Uh, my wife is fully dressed and she's got a coat on and she kisses me on the head and with a concerned look she says are you sure you're going to be okay and i say yeah i'll be fine i don't know what she's talking about i'm just woken up um, and i lay there for a minute trying to make sense of what's happening and she she quietly leaves the room goes down the stairs and closes the door and she's gone and then i remember my wife has arranged to go out for the whole day with a friend on a well-deserved kids-free trip to London. I'm at home with my four kids alone, no backup, no second pair of hands, and after a busy week, no plan. And for about 20 seconds, the house is completely silent. Birds are singing, all's peaceful. And then I hear the giggle and the pitter-patter of tiny feet upstairs. And then suddenly the bedroom door bursts open and immediately comes the obvious big question. Dad, what are we doing today? Now this question is loaded with meaning. My kids are looking for leadership, they're looking for direction. They want me to make a decision to decide how we're gonna spend this precious time we have together. But I'm tired, I've just woken up, I haven't had coffee yet. Am I really the best person to decide? Do I really know each of the kids' deepest desires, uh, what, what they are for the day ahead? How can I deal with these professional negotiators uh, with different, different needs uh, and decide how the day should go? And I guess in the, in the past, I would have kind of gone into a default mode where I would have sent them downstairs to stick the TV on or go and ask them to put on their iPads. And the, the day can kind of easily turn into a bunch of squabbles and bickering and the kids feeling annoyed that we're not doing that they want to do and me feeling tired by the amount of mental energy needing to stop them killing each other instead of actually spending the quality of time with them that I've been looking forward to all week. But this Saturday, I decided that it was gonna be different I decided in a moment of inspiration, uh, or maybe a lack of caffeine, I decided I was going to try something different. I decided I was going to bring my work home. Now, before you speed dial social services, let me tell you a little bit about what I actually do. Uh, but, but to do that, I need to take you back to November, uh, which uh, was kind of a less happy time for me back in 2017. Uh, I progressed to a senior manager uh, in a really great company with some brilliant people, some brilliant design people, some brilliant technical people. But I kind of find myself in a career cul-de-sac. Uh, I was reading about agile and design thinking and ways of working, but I couldn't convince the senior management team to adopt this kind of methodology. And we were kind of stuck in this process of producing these hundreds of page specification documents that we'd ask a client to sign off and then we'd go and build stuff and deliver it and we'd not even conduct any user research. It would all be based on assumptions. And I knew that this was not how I wanted to work. So after a 
a lot of kind of contemplation and thought, I decided that it was time to kind of move on and look for something else. And I was looking for somewhere where I'd have this opportunity to focus on uh, more of a user-centered design approach uh, in an agile environment. And luckily, uh, fast forward to June, uh, uh, January, sorry, uh, in, in 2018, and I found this new job, new first day uh, working for a company uh, called Spark. Not heard of before. I was a little apprehensive. It was a big change for me, uh, being in one company for kind of over 10 years. Uh, and I was kind of jumping in two feet. I was going to give this thing a go and just see where it led. Uh, my first day, uh, I went down to London uh, to collect a Mac and meet some of the Spark team and get a bit of an insight out of think how things worked. Uh, so this is what I learned on my first day. Spark, Street Design Consultancy. That's quite hard to say. Uh, it was cre created fairly recently, kind of 2017, 20, I think at the beginning of 2017. And it was in the response to a rising demand for human-centered design. So it was kind of focused on the creative aspects of uh, digital technology. But it's actually part of BGSS. Uh, and BGSS have been around a lot longer. Uh, and they're the largest uh, independently owned IT consultants in the UK and uh, specialised in enterprise agile uh, and recent winners of the Queen's Award. So this was all brilliant. This is exactly what I've been looking for. I almost found like I got really lucky with this. And I had a bit of a kind of overview of how those two things together. So this is the only consultancy diagram that you'll see in this presentation. Uh, but you can see on the right hand side, there's this whole thing around BGSS. Uh, making sure we deliver the right stuff. And on the left hand side of the red, this is about Spark, making sure uh, that we actually focus on the right things. And the way that I kind of simplified it for me, I guess, is uh, BGSS makes sure we build the things right, while Spark makes sure we build the right things. Uh, and this seemed like, you know, I kind of landed on my feet, it was exactly what I wanted to do. So day two, first project. Uh, it was for the driving and vehicle standards agency, the DVSA, uh, 14 weeks to redesign the way that driving tests are conducted in the UK. Now the driving test has been going for 80 years and there's 1.8 million tests conducted last year. We've got a client that had never worked in Agile before and a product owner that had never been on a digital project. So straight away I'm thinking, mm, this is going to be a challenge. So throw into that mix, we've got uh, driving examiners, 60% uh, of them aged over 50, spread across 350 sites in England, Scotland and Wales, and reluctant to move away from their current paper-based process. So we're coming in with a big digital, yay, we're going to digitize this, and driving examiners go, no, we don't want that. Uh, so that was another challenge. The third challenge was that uh, this whole thing was going to go through a government digital services standard assessment. Now, if you don't know what that is, basically any, any service that is produced uh, for government has to be assessed. And the way that I kind of talk about it to friends is it's almost like an Ofsted for design and technology. So if you were a teacher and you got Ofsted, that you get somebody around to check that you, you're doing all the things in the right way. Not worked in GDS before, didn't know anything about it. So I had these really three big, big challenges uh, on this new project. Uh, but I thought, you know what, let's give it a go. So I'm going to show you a very quick overview now. Unfortunately, the sound doesn't seem to work. So I might talk through a little bit. And this should give you a bit of an insight into what we achieved in, in only 14 weeks. So there was a lot of initial contextual research and observation research where we're actually going into test centers, talking to the people that conducted uh, driving tests. And we also had the opportunity to go out on driving tests and talk to candidates. Uh, we mapped end-to-end -end journeys that went across a whole range of different user groups. Uh, we collaborated together to actually produce prototypes And compared, I guess, to how I was used to working before, it all felt kind of scrappy a little bit, I suppose. It, it, we were working really fast and iteratively. So we weren't spending loads and loads of time on getting things super polished. Uh, we were getting things out quickly and going out and actually sitting with users and getting conducting usability testing uh, and user research on the things that we were producing. 
Uh, and this meant we were traveling all over the country. So we visited, uh, I can't remember how many test centers in the end, but it was a lot. Uh, and we did workshops actually in test centers with users. Uh, so you can see in this example here, this is probably one of the highlights of the project for me was conducting uh, a workshop in a test center with driving examiners, uh, helping them to articulate what they needed from this, this solution. Uh, we also conducted in-car usability tests as well, and we came up with some innovative ways of measuring cognitive load uh, to try and ensure that the driving examiners that were adopting this new technology weren't finding it any more difficult than the process that they currently followed. So I hope that gives you some kind of flavour there. I managed to kind of talk over it. The music added something, but never mind. Uh, so yeah, the output then. So in, in over 14 weeks, we interviewed over 100 people. Uh, I've never experienced anything like that before. Being able to actually talk to that many people about a product or service that you're actually developing and actually involve them in the design process, to me, was amazing. It was brilliant. Um, we had not only me going out and observe uh, and meet users, we had the whole team. So that included developers, included business analysts. Uh, and what was brilliant about that was that they could then empathize with, with all the user research that was being done. And they could uh, be involved in creating prototypes and be involved in co-design workshops. And it really meant that the whole team was focused on ensuring we were develop, developing and delivering a, a brilliant solution. But the outcomes were maybe even more impressive, I guess. In the DVSA had tried to do this multiple times before and failed. Uh, but we'd achieved more, actually we did it in 12 weeks, than they'd managed to do uh, at any time they've tried to do that process before. And we were appointed to then go on to produce the beta solution, uh, which had just been completed actually. Uh, driving examiners gave us some brilliant feedback uh, on the early prototypes. And we got a great insight into user needs and what we needed to do on focusing on the next stage. And GDS, uh, in our four hour interrogation uh, assessment should i say not interrogation uh, we passed our assessment two weeks early uh, and they said the team was empowered and focused on meeting user needs so surely i thought surely if this approach can work on such a complex problem with a team that had never worked together before surely i could use some of these methods and techniques with the problem that i had at home so let's go back Saturday the 23rd. Now four minutes past seven. I'm still blurry eyed. But in a moment of pure inspiration, or maybe it was a lack of caffeine, I utter these four magic words. Let's try an experiment. Now this, this threw them, this threw the kids. They didn't know what to make of that. That's not what he normally says. I could see their little calculating faces trying to weigh it up. And what I'd done is I'd use a classic design thinking technique. I'd reframe the problem. I'd taken dad, what are we doing today? And turned it into, let's try an experiment. Now, immediately this took away the pressure for us to get things right. It's an experiment, might work, it might not. They relaxed and I relaxed and we were ready to start to be creative. So the next thing I did is I kind of had them on the rope. So I hit it in with another design thinking classic. How might we? Now, if you're ever in a design thinking workshop, you'll hear how might we, I don't know how many times, but it will come up repeatedly. Uh, and what I wanted to do is actually think about how might we collaborate and make creative choices about how to spend the next 12 hours together in a way which everyone will enjoy. How do we gather everybody's ideas and decide what we want to do? So we started an initial conversation uh, and I wanted to encourage all kids to actually take part in it. Uh, what do we like doing? Where do we like to go? What haven't we done for ages? And we started it with a, a bit of a brainstorm and I purposely made this a silent brainstorm. You can see on the right there, my youngest one does, can't even write, but he was still contributing ideas. Uh, and the older kids have got a tendency to influence the quieter younger kids. So by giving them a silent brainstorm, everyone's got the opportunity to contribute. Uh, I gave them uh, different colored post notes uh, as well, so I could tell who was submitting what idea. And we spent a few minutes documenting all the things that we'd like to do. And the next activity was all about sorting those ideas then. Uh, 
uh, we wanted to, see, to find com common themes and group things into clusters. Uh, and occasionally I needed to kind of step in and direct them a little bit, but I was quite surprised at how quickly they started to work in a collaborative way without bickering, no arguments. And the next step of the process was about them dotting. Uh, they were all given two dots uh, and they, uh, five dots, sorry, and they could give a, a maximum of two dots per single idea. And we discarded some ideas that weren't popular before finally we created a map. Uh, and on our map, we drew out what we were going to do for the day. This was our timeline. Uh, and what was good about this, if we could stick this to the fridge, and I also took a photograph of it on my phone as well. So if we were out and about, whenever they say to me, Dad, Dad, what are we doing? What are we doing next? What are we doing next? I said, well, go and look at the fridge. Or you know, let's just look at the picture on the phone. We're in the park. And it, this, this kind of simplistic plan, I was really surprised at how effective it was. Uh, we'd gone through this really simple kind of process, which if you, if you are generating ideas and you think you're using a design thinking kind of mindset approach, it's, this, is, this is basic stuff. Everybody does this all the time. But what I'd not thought is actually to take this home and try it with the kids at home. And the, the outcome was uh, we had a really great day. We had some really quality time together. Uh, there was no arguing. We had this kind of shared vision that we could refer to. Uh, but for me, I guess, the, the main thing for me was the look of smugness on my face when my wife came home late in that evening expecting to find me exhausted on the settee. And I was quite relaxed and we'd had this brilliant day and you know, what, what have you done? How have you done it? Uh, so I've got a couple of tips at this point. Firstly, your partner is going to think you've gone mad <laughs> unless you explain beforehand uh, what you're planning to do. If you, if, she, you know, if she or he comes home at the end of the day and finds post-it notes all over the wall, yeah, she's probably going to think you've gone a bit bonkers. Uh, second tip, don't give kids Sharpies. <laughs> it, it doesn't come off furniture. It doesn't come off walls. It doesn't come off sisters' faces. They are permanent. Uh, use tip pens. <laughs> uh, but this, this was, worked so well, I decided to uh, take it a bit further. And I started to think about what other parenting pain points could I tackle? Uh, and I started to talk to other friends that are designers as well and said, well, do you, you know, do you do this kind of thing at home? Uh, and surprisingly, people said, no. And I said, well, why not? And they said, well, I don't know. I might, I might give it a go. Uh, and I think particularly if people are involved uh, in, in agile teams or they're using design thinking, it's almost like an obvious thing when you think about it. So, yeah, well, why don't we collaborate a little bit more? and try and solve problems together as a family, rather than me falling into this kind of dictator mode where I'm gonna tell you what to do and you're gonna go off and do it. So, obvious thing for a design thinker to do is to start to think, map things out in terms of journeys. Uh, so I started to look at where I was experiencing pain points as a, as a parent in other areas as well. So I mapped out the stages uh, of a typical day uh, for a design thinking dad and then I thought about okay well what kind of activities do we do what am I doing typically during that time and then I thought about well out of those activities where are my pain points where where do we have issues where things take a bit longer or I end up moaning or griping about things or the kids aren't happy or they don't look forward to it uh, and the first thing I guess uh, the biggest pain point for me at that time uh, was this it's about walking to school every morning. I was trying to get out to work and we had to get the bags and the shoes and we had this kind of system that just wasn't working, which meant I ended up barking at them in the morning. I'm not a morning person anyway. Uh, and then my wife's trying to get out to work and I'm trying to get out to work. And then we got to, one of us got to do the school run and it, it, it was just a real pain. And I, I guess this, this symbol, I was quite surprised actually. For many years, I thought it represented a a grown adult forcibly dragging a small person towards school. Uh, but actually, I read an interview recently uh, with a designer called Margaret Calvert who actually designed this sign. Uh, it was introduced in the 1960s. Uh, and this is actually two children going to school, which surprised me, but it, it, that's apparently what it is. Uh, but what we, we decided to do is we decided to do a bit of a discovery and think about, well, how can we make the school run more fun? How can we make it more interesting? So on the first part of our discovery, we started asking questions. 
how far is it to school? Is it further if you've only got little legs? Uh, how long would it take if you walked? Or what about if you hopped or scooted? Uh, how long does it take friends to go a similar way? And one of the things that we, we did early on was actually look on Google Maps to see, okay, well, how far is it really? Uh, and the kids became kind of fascinated with these blue dots. Uh, and we started asking what if questions. What if these blue dots really existed? Uh, where would they appear on our journey? And how far would it be between each dot? And how many dots would it actually take to get to school? So we tried, we thought we'd try an experiment and we came up with this, this solution called the dot to dot dash. Uh, and this is a kind of co-creation approach. So each child was given 20 dots and they're allowed to mark them anywhere along the route on the way to school. And what we were trying to do is break down the route into smaller sections. So it didn't seem like uh, the beginning of the journey was at home and the end of the journey was at school. We were getting from one dot to the next dot, from one dot to the next dot, and one dot to the next dot. And the outcome, I guess, for this was that the kids became, uh, actually looked forward to the, the morning school run because they wanted to go and count the dots and see if they could count them all. Uh, and actually, I, I, I recorded the times so from a user research perspective, uh, and we managed to shave about one minute, 12 seconds off the average school run time uh, with a, a one week kind of A-B testing comparison. Uh, so it made it less painful. Uh, so I decided that, again, maybe there were other areas that I could take this kind of approach uh, and uh, reduce the kind of parenting pain points that I was experiencing. So at the time, the next parenting pain point I had was, was about car journeys. Now this is probably a comment that's heard on motorway traffic jams all over the UK when we're actually driving around in our cars again. Uh, and we came up with a, a, a kind of joint solution. And a bit of this was inspired by a conversation with, I had with a guy called Professor Gary Burnett from the University of Nottingham Human Factors Research Group. And he was doing some research into sat-nav uh, navigation instructions. And what he discovered is that uh, humans take in much more visual information if they're given more human-like instructions. So if your sat-nav says, uh, in 50 yards, take the second exit, you don't take as much information in visually uh, than if it, if it were to say something along the lines of, at the church, turn left. So we rely on visual indications uh, a, lot, a lot more. And it got me thinking about, well, what, what are the kids really asking when they're saying, oh, are we nearly there yet? And does the answer that I'm giving them actually make sense to them? So we came up with something called the in-car progress bar. Uh, and this has been tested quite a lot. I've had people uh, come up with all sorts of variations of it. And it's quite simple. All you do is you get your kids to imagine a line across the top of the car uh, inside. And you have them imagine the start to the left of the car and the finish to the right. And whenever they ask, are we nearly there yet? You just point to where you are in the in-car progress bar. So at the beginning, that's where you start. And at the end, that's where you finish. Uh, and some of the variations I've had of that have been really interesting. So one of my friends has now got a uh, Bing bunny, uh, masking taped across the inside of a car. And Bing starts on the left and the carrot is on the right. Uh, and as they move across uh, and they get closer in their journey, Bing moves across as well. Uh, she's got a little bit of Velcro that she sticks on the inside of her car, but she said it, work, it does work brilliantly. Uh, but it was, it was down to me, I guess, thinking differently about what the kids were actually asking. So this is a question I often get asked, is this worth my time? You know, it sounds like a lot of effort. And if you're a parent, you're already busy uh, and managing your kids' time and uh, doing the watching and all the other chores that you're faced to doing. But there's a couple of good reasons. Uh, the first one is, is maybe more for parents. Uh, but it, it is quite apparent, I think, at the minute. It's been quite interesting seeing how parents have been keeping their children occupied over the last kind of month or so. And a lot of people are kind of coming back to these kind of creative activities which are about making or about painting or about uh, doing things together. But I, my, my other half, my wife is a teacher, uh, and we've got lots of friends that are lecturers. And I started to kind of ask ask them how creativity and problem solving is actually being taught. Uh, and I've actually talked to the kids as well, like how do you generate a new idea? 
uh, or how do you collaborate or how do you share ideas or how, what do you do at school to communicate your ideas and I've kind of taken a little bit of a closer look I guess at uh, primary and secondary education in particular and it seems to me that the current curriculum is probably too focused on numbers it's not particularly holistic and teachers seem quite frightened to experiment in fear of failing Ofsted uh, and recently I spoke to a senior quite a senior employee of the uh, Department for Education and even he thought that schools have been taken back to the 1950s uh, and he felt that we're not really preparing our kids with the learning skills that they need for the future. Uh, so this is a statistic that I've pulled out from a, a report from the Design Council and it's pretty depressing I guess for a designer uh, and that goes alongside uh, a big decrease in the number of students uh, leaving university with arts and design degree so that decreased by about 7% in, in 2017 uh, which is a shame because uh, I think in a way these are the skills that people need. Uh, I'm quite lucky I guess with, with Spark and BGSS we've had the opportunity uh, to run design thinking and agile workshops with local primary schools and uh, they actually got in touch with us to start off with and they wanted to know what it was like to work in tech. So rather than give them a tour of the building, we actually uh, conducted a, a workshop with them uh, to help them to design their most awesome day at school and their most awesome school to, to actually conduct that school day in. Uh, and it was brilliant to see how uh, creative these young minds were and how open they were to creating ideas and for me, I guess these are the problem solvers of the future, of our future, and they're going to tackle the massive challenges that we face today. And I can't think of a greater gift to give those little people than the ability to solve problems, share ideas uh, and have empathy for one another. But at the same time, there's another challenge as well, because the algorithms are coming. Uh, we had a great presentation a, a couple of months ago now about the fourth industrial revolution. And if you've not heard about this, you really should do. And it was a lunch and learn with a guy called John Davis, who's head of technology consulting at BGSS. And it was brilliant insight into things like machine learning, natural language processing and computer vision. And this fourth industrial revolution is a tsunami of change that's gonna dramatically affect the way that we live and really we uh, relate to one another. And it got me thinking about the impact that this will have on the skills that people will need at work. Uh, this is another quote from the World Economic Forum uh, and the predictions that I've kind of read there's roughly around one fifth of the global workforce will be impacted by AI and automation. Uh, and the most significant impact is in developed nations like the UK, Germany and the US. Uh, so how do, you how do you protect your career? Uh, how do you make sure that you are still relevant in this kind of new change world? What are the skills that we'll need to survive during this kind of tech revolution. So the World Economic Forum have done a lot of research into this uh, and there's the core skills which won't change so there's those foundation literacies but there's these new competencies and qualities uh, that will need to survive and these are human skills of course so they're things like critical thinking and problem solving, creativity, innovation, communication, collaboration and these are exactly the kind of skills that you need a design thinker. So that's great news uh, if you're a design thinker. It's not so great if you are a lorry driver or a taxi driver uh, or somebody whose job is in, in danger of being automated. So where do you start? So I, I would say start now, that's the best place to start. Uh, so I'm gonna give you five design thinking tips for surviving lockdown. And these are based on things that I've been doing and experimenting with at home and with the family. Uh, and hopefully uh, they'll help you a little bit uh, with your situation that you've got at, at home as well. So the first thing is to agree ways of working with your co-workers. Uh, so whenever we start an agile project, a big part of that first uh, sprint zero is it often called, is, is agreeing how you're going to work together. Uh, and one of the things that I think is easy to forget is to uh, almost fall into that dictator mode again where as a parent you're saying right this is how we're going to work we're going to do it like this go and do that uh, so we we created our family home lockdown rules uh, and this was a way for us to all uh, 
express how we felt about living together in this way and for us all to understand some kind of uh, structure to how the day is going to work uh, and this lives on our kitchen door so it's visible it's really clear uh, to everybody uh, and what we've also been trying to do is to do family retros as well so at the end of each week we kind of get together and ask well how did it go this week what are we going to change next week what didn't go so well uh, and it's not about naming or shaming, it's about improving uh, and recognising when things aren't going to plan, but also celebrating the good stuff uh, and making sure that that's not forgotten too. Uh, another thing that I think is really important from a design thinking perspective is uh, you need to kind of show your work, you need to make it visual. Don't, don't make your home into a classroom. Life's messy. Make your home into a creative environment where it's safe to get things wrong and encourage your kids to, to play and experiment with these things. Uh, this is our living room wall. <laughs> uh, so I, with the kids, we decided that it was boring. Uh, so we used a load of tape to decorate it in a way that they thought uh, was how it should be. And we've been using it to actually put work up there and uh, show work that we've actually been doing together at home. Uh, and it, trying to encourage them to kind of show their, their process and what they're doing and their iterations as well. Uh, and it's important in a way for me that uh, people can see that you care about what they're doing and value outcomes over outputs. This is probably my favorite one is, is reframing problems. And reframing is how designers get unstuck and make sure that we actually work on solving the right problem. And it allows us to take a step back and, and see that bigger picture. We've all got problems, uh, but each of them in a way is an opportunity or an, I like to think of them as, as an invitation to try something new. You know, if you start asking yourself, how might we, or what if, and suddenly uh, something that was a problem becomes an opportunity. So we, we had a problem, uh, maths is boring. Uh, kids don't like doing maths uh, and our daily exercise routine was a bit boring we were just going around the block and doing the same kind of thing so we teamed up uh, with some local families and we created math exercise so uh, we took it in turns to set questions uh, for different families around the block uh, and then they all had the opportunity to go out and find the questions to start off with uh, and, and then answer them as well as we went around on our daily routines uh, we also had a challenge of missing out on family connections uh, and we, we, we enjoy playing games and we couldn't figure out how we might do that together. So we came up with a Jenga jam uh, and that's uh, myself and my, uh, my two sisters and their family. We've all got a, uh, a version of Jenga in the house. So we all play Jenga at the same time, but against each other. And that's been a really great way to kind of socialize and take people's minds off what's happening outside, I think. Uh, curiosity is makes kind of for me anyway it makes everything new again it helps to invite uh, exploration and it encourages kids and, and adults I think they're waiting to engage in the world in, in a new light uh, I try and look for everyday opportunities to engage uh, my kids kind of curiosity and I think from an early age it's kids do kind of ask why and I think it's really important that you don't let them lose that make sure that they do keep asking why. Uh, we were clearing the shed last weekend, as I'm sure many people are, and we found these old bits of wood in the shed. There's no, no instructions and there's nothing there. That you could have just chucked them in the bin. Uh, but the kids were kind of curious about what they could make out of them. And they must have spent about two or three hours in the garden. I kind of challenged them to come up with the most bizarre creature that they could create. Uh, so this is a, a dinosaur. Uh, and we were kind of teaching them to kind of think with their hands. And I think that a little bit of this can be lost, I think, nowadays, because everything does come with an instruction manual and it's prepackaged. There's something quite uh, endearing about giving, going back to basics and just encouraging kids to just play with materials and see what they can come up with. We've also tried to, to be doing toy hacks as well and reinventing existing toys. Uh, this is our Duploplex. And the kids decided that now they had their own theatre, they needed to create a play. Uh, so they wrote a short play about a super light butterfly and a grumpy old elephant. 
who was a bit of a downer and they had a bit of a fight but the elephant lost and the super light butterfly won and as you can see it was sold out we've got like a front row audience there uh, it was a packed house but the kids again they would kind of taken something that was every day and they reinvented it and it, it, it that imagination part of what they were doing really helped to bring it to life for them the final point i think is if you take anything from this session just try try an experiment just take one thing away uh, and, and try to use it to, to nurture your little people. It might not change the world, but it might just might lead to a little bit more joy uh, in your day to day life. So I'm going to finish on this quote. This is a, a brilliant quote from a guy called Tim Brown. Uh, and it's something that I hold quite, quite dear, I think, about treating life as a prototype. I think if you don't try things, you can feel trapped. And if you don't go out and conduct experiments and make discoveries, it can, uh, you can miss out on opportunities that are actually there. Uh, I think in particular, this last, this last bit about learning to measure success by your ideas and not on your bank accounts and, and the impact of the world for me really resonates. Uh, and I hope it does too for you. So that brings me neatly onto the book. Uh, so Ellie has been uh, monitoring the the, uh, the the channel on Twitter, I think. So Ellie, have you got a winner for us? Hello. Yes. So um, it's Gemma Curry. I think that's your pronounced name. So we'll get in touch with you on Twitter, and we can send you the book out as soon as possible. So congratulations! Uh, it would be great when you get the book if you could send us a picture uh, of you with it. I would really appreciate that. Uh, but thank you very much, everyone. I really enjoyed sharing this with you. And I hope you do take something away. And please do go away and try and experiment. Uh, I have got one last thing to say. So I am doing a bit of design thinking dad disco. Don't worry, there's no dancing. It's disco short discovery. Uh, and I have been talking to parents generally about some of these ideas that I've had. So if you're a parent and you are interested in a more creative or collaborative approach to parenting, I'd love to hear from you, so get in touch. Thank you very much. So we'll take any questions now, if anybody has any, if you want to write them in the chat. Um, there's a lot of positive comments on here, Paul. People have been writing all the way through about their experiences and things they're gonna take away. Everyone's saying it was a great talk. So if there's any questions, um, write them in the chat and Paul can answer them. If not, um, we can answer any questions after the session. The session has also been recorded, so I know a few of you missed a few of the, the points that uh, Paul has mentioned. So please um, watch, back, watch the recording back if you want to answer any of those questions you've got. So we do have a question in, Paul. Um, do you have any ideas for design thinking for house shares during lockdown? That's a good one. Ooh, house shares. <laughs> Well, I guess maybe that comes back to the ways of working element. Uh, if you, are you uh, I don't know specifically what that refers to, but I wonder if, if you have multiple families living in the same house. She says four 25 year old gals. Must be quite challenging. <laughs> Definitely agree ways of working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, how do you think the creative landscape will change in a post-coronavirus world? I'm, I'm really optimistic, actually. I think it's really uh, opened up a lot of uh, parents' eyes into education uh, and what maybe is important and what's not important. And I think actually a lot of people have, a lot of my friends anyway, have gone back to things that they've not been doing. They've found that they're picking up those hobbies again that they've, not done for years because I've been so busy doing other things suddenly they're finding that yeah I am I am gonna turn my computer off at the end of the day I'm gonna read a book or I'm gonna pick off you know that watercolor course that I've been meaning to do for years or years and I'm quite optimistic that we'll see a bit of a creative revival once this is all over and people will actually reflect on it and and see that it's maybe changed things for the better mm -hmm. yeah I totally agree. Um, the next one we've got is how much do you have to flex your workshops between projects and clients adapting some of the trademark design thinking workshops? Ooh, a lot. 
Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's like anything really. There's not. There's there's, there's methods and mindsets, but how you apply them is completely different each time. It, it, it's it, and a little bit, I guess, for that comes with experience. Uh, but there's no. There's lots of books and information, but there's not. There's no. You can't really beat the actual real experience of doing it. So if you're interested in learning more about design thinking and facilitation, my best bit of advice is just go and do some even if it's not with real pe real clients go and do it with some friends or relatives and actually get that that real ex real life experience mm -hmm. how do you deal with user testing during covid19 oh that's a tricky one uh that's probably one more for more for you isn't it rebecca <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i think from a spark perspective and a research perspective, we're just carrying on. It's like pretty much business as usual from a from a testing point of view. We've actually got a lot of remote um, ways of working that we've been doing when COVID nineteen wasn't happening. So we were doing remote testing to access people across the, the country that we needed to access for such as NHS projects, um, surveys, and things like that. Um, but from a testing point of view, there are ways of going around it. You can kind of mirror your phone. You can use things like Zoom to share your screen and, and show a participant uh, the, the, test, the journey that you're testing. Um, there are a lot of other ways. So if you want to have a chat with me separate to this call, I'm happy to take any questions and to actually share some of our remote uh, testing packs with you, um, if that would be helpful. Yeah. We, I mean, we've been, it's quite interesting, I think, in the, the project that I mentioned uh, in the presentation, we were kind of working remote already. So we had people flying in from Poland, from Ireland, people joining in, in, in Nottingham from London, from Wales. So we were using tools like Miro and Zoom and all these other things for the last two years. Uh, mm -hmm. So in a way, it's not made that much of a difference. I think the challenge is perhaps when you need to do face-to-face, -face, if you need to do some kind of user testing, uh, that, that's probably a bit more of a challenge at the minute, but there's lots of ways around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it just like with this festival, it's allowing us to reach more people. Um, I think seeing it as a positive more than a negative, and I guess, I guess taking your advice, Paul, reframing the problem, um, and yeah. think how can we get some some research on whatever it is that we're testing um, it might yeah. be that we have to adapt we can't do it exactly as we used to but there definitely are ways around it yeah. got a couple more questions coming in so how do you balance between work from home and juggling with kids and their needs and wants that is a challenge with four kids yeah uh, I'm, I guess I'm quite lucky. We, we so far we've managed by uh, me and my wife kind of splitting our time. So it does mean that sometimes we're kind of having to stagger uh, when we're working, which is, which is quite hard. It's an extra kind of cognitive load there, isn't there? Where you suddenly you're working and then you're in parent mode and then you're working again. Uh, but so far that that's worked, but it, it does require a lot of extra energy in terms of communication with each other and patience and remembering that you are all in this kind of situation together. Uh, I've got a couple of, uh, not default activities, but each of the kids have, has got activities that they can go to, that they've chosen, that are in their room. So if we all need a bit of time out, we can say, okay, we'll go and choose an activity. And if all, each of the child's got an activity board that they've come up with in their bedroom which they can pick something on there and they can do quietly by themselves for a period of time. Uh, but I guess I'm quite lucky in that my youngest is, is six. So they're all fairly independent up to a point. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you had any experiences when you've had to p uh, pivot a workshop midway through or any pitfalls you've encountered? I'm, I'm guessing. Oh, yeah, loads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that i think you've you've got to be able to think on your feet definitely uh you know sometimes you must start out uh particularly i guess on when when you're working on projects discovery you might start out thinking that your workshop's about one thing but quite quickly maybe seniors
can plan out, you might not end up with the right outcome anyway. Okay, uh, I don't know if there's any more questions coming in. Is there any more questions at all? Or there's a lot of positive comments about yeah. you've inspired a lot of people, Paul, to, to take these ideas and making people think more creatively about how to apply some of these to lockdown. Um, we've got another one here. Have, have you done any collaborative wireframing when the wireframes become hard to interpret at a later date and how do you avoid this? Sorry, I dropped out there. <laughs> Sorry, we've got another question here. Um, have you done any collaborative wireframing when the wireframes become hard to interpret at a later date and how do you avoid this? I've not done anything where the wireframes, well, actually, yeah, no, I have. So on that project that I showed you there, we were, in a weird position where we had quite a lot of devs early on and we were all wireframing at the same time. So one of the things that I tried to do up front was give some people some basic wireframing tips. Mm. We've lost you again. I think we've lost you <laughs> again. Yeah, he keeps dropping out. Um, I'm interested to what he's going to say actually. <laughs> We've been doing some collaborative wireframing this week for a, for a client that I'm working on, uh, including doing some remote user testing, actually. But we didn't necessarily come up with that problem, I think. I think tying it back to the user story and the user journey um, is really important to make sure that you still have that. It's easy to interpret for if you, like after the project has ended, it still makes sense from a user journey point of view. Yeah, and, and I think just to, obviously we've lost Paul at the moment, but we will be able to follow up on all questions anyway. So we've got everything recorded, so we will send a follow up on that. Um, and if there's anything else that people have thought of that we've not managed to cover, do please drop us a line. I think, have you got any more, Rebecca, that you can answer that have come through? Yes, there's another one here. How would you recommend getting into a user research mindset and gain the ability to constantly question things? Any hints and tips? Yeah, this one, I would just put yourself in the user's shoes. If you were the user, could you do that journey? Could you, look, could you understand that wireframe? Could you add something to basket and remove it and do everything that you want to do if you were the user of that particular product? That would be my advice there around getting into a user mindset. Um, and constantly questioning things and thinking, how, how could I do that differently if I was my sister or if I was my dad or if I was my granddad who has poor sight? How would I then be thinking differently? I think with user research, you always need to put yourself back into the user's point of view and creating some basic personas about what are their basic needs and pain points uh, to help you really get that user-centered perspective. Um, we've got a few other questions here. I think we've got Paul back now. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hey, sorry about that. I don't know what's happened. My connection just stopped. Um, have you done did any you collaborative wireframing? That's the one that we were on. Yes. Have you done any collaborative wireframing when the wireframes became hard to interpret at a later date and how do you avoid this? So, so I was trying to that one, but I don't think I've actually had any, any issues because what I was saying was tying it back to the user, the user journey and having a, a screen flow that ties into what the user steps are going to be. Um, yeah. So normally, I guess the way that we often work is that uh, things, wire, think wireframes uh, are mapped against user journeys, but also they're iterated quite quickly. And we usually try and make them visual as well. So they're on a wall somewhere and the whole team can see them and we're talking about them all the time. So it's, it's rare that we would produce wireframes and put them away in a cupboard to bring them out later on, they would be visible uh, yeah. to everybody, so. Yeah, totally agree with that one. Um, any tips on managing projects creatively? Uh, collaboration is definitely key. Uh, I'm not sure about project management, if that's, I don't know. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I've found that has worked really well, I think are are the agile kind of things that we do. So having regular stand-ups, actually having regular show and tells to demonstrate what value you've delivered uh, in that period of time. I think they're, they're the things that have really made a difference for me compared to how I used to work. 
when I was working in a waterfall kind of uh, approach. Uh, I think also making your work visible, and I've probably said that a few times now, but if you can enable the team to see the value that you've added in that sprint and you can communicate that value, uh, it means that everybody's on board with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I agree. One, one of the, the big things that we did uh, on driving examiner services was actually get everybody out to meet users. So the whole team went out to meet driving examiners and go to test centers. And I think that made such a massive difference. And it was quite a, a big commit from the client to get them to agree to that. But it paid off massively uh, throughout that project because that whole team were rallying behind uh, you know, reducing these pain points for these users. And I think that's, that's something that uh, from a project perspective is, is a brilliant thing to do if you can. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that, getting, user, getting people to watch the, the research and speak to the, the users. Um, I think another thing that Spark have been doing is using, to, to try and be more creative, is to use um, remote tools. So we've been using Zoom quite a lot and we've actually been running cross office workshops um, and managing little side projects that are going on by collaborating on one um, Miro, sorry, on one Miro board, um, which has been really a nice creative way to, to all collaborate together when we're all at, apart but at home. And I think that ties into the next question. So, what software does Spark use for design? So, we've got Figma, yes, um, and I've just said Miro. A lot depends on the client as well, doesn't it? So. Uh, we, we sometimes have challenges with, with the client not being able to get various software. So we do adapt to projects, but uh, and definitely things like Miro, uh, Sketch is on there. Abstract is quite a good tool that we've been using for version control where you've got multiple UI designers working on the same project at the same time. Uh, there's a whole plethora of things like Zoom and Teams and all the other things that uh, we're communicating with uh, mm -hmm. by video. Uh, but sometimes it's just post-it notes and, and Sharpies and I don't think we should forget all, all the basic tools that actually where a lot of the ideas kind of come from at the beginning. Yeah. So there's, there's quite a few more questions uh, coming in. Should we take one more and then answer the rest offline, Karen, or do you want to, to run over? Yeah, I mean, it's up to you guys, really. I think, yeah, maybe do a couple more and then we will follow up and do a proper session, follow-up session without all the information on and anything yeah. else we can cover. Yeah. Okay, so how do you promote design thinking in old-fashioned industries? <laughs> where people are set in their ways. That's a good one. Uh, get them to do it. Get them to experience it. Uh, DVSA. They're going through a huge digital transformation at the minute and they're going from this kind of paper-based old school kind of ways of working and trying to adopt agile and, and digital. And uh, I did a workshop there back in June where we got the whole of their service team <clears throat> just to do a design thinking workshop. Uh, and it was kind of pitched in a lighthearted way. It was a design thinking down boot camp and it was about solving everyday pain points that people had. Uh, but again, by doing it, people then start to see the value in it. They start to talk about it. Uh, they talk to their managers about it. And suddenly you can start to break down those silos. Uh, but the best thing you can do is try and get in there and, and do an, try an experiment. Mm -hmm. And showing, showing the value, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, have you found people are sometimes too scared to draw? <laughs> so All the time. Time. Yeah. <laughs> all the time but don't worry about that I think there's, a, there's some brilliant warm-up activities and uh, one of the things that I often do is uh, is a kind of empathy activity uh, and it, I, I don't know what the name of it is but I call it the sunset activity and I get people I ask them say draw a sunset so everybody you know draws a sunset and usually it looks something like this <laughs> and pretty much everybody draws the same sort of thing uh, and I only give them 30 seconds to do it I'm quite mean uh, but then I ask them to do the same thing again to so draw a sunset but but this time when you draw it think about where you were think about who you were with yeah I was lost him I lost him again but, yeah 
So I guess well, views on the, dis uh, the dis discipline of designing for the needs of real users rather than made up personas. I think I can answer this one from a research perspective as well. Think about what you were doing. Oh, it's, it's come back again. <laughs> Sorry, Paul, I start talking because we lost you again. That's all right. If you lose me, just, just do something. Yeah. Wave. Okay, so we just went on to the next question around what are your views on the discipline of uh, designing for the needs of real users rather than made up personas? I think that's crucial. Uh, I'm not a massive fan of personas per se. I think they have some use, but I think sometimes UX can get tied up in creating the ultimate persona and forget about user needs. Mm -hmm. uh, we went down a slightly different route on the last project I went. Uh, we started out with personas, but then we moved more into a kind of character kind of approach where we were thinking about whether people were willing to make the change or not. And it was less about, here's Jeff and he's 45 and he's a banker. It was more about, well, this is somebody that's confident with technology and willing to make the change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I get the gist of what Paul's saying. Yeah. Um, I think it's really good to use personas to start um, to start getting into that user research mindset. But then actually we need to be interviewing real people and actually doing user centered design rather than basing it all on this creative persona that needs to be used for marketing or sometimes companies and clients can get really hooked up and really focused in on creating this amazing persona, but actually do you understand what your customer needs are? Because that's, that's what the main thing that you should be addressing. Yeah. So I think obviously there's quite a few questions still left, but we will follow up. Um, thanks so much for the session today. It was a great one, really well attended. Um, we've got how many more Spark sessions? I think about six, seven more to do. Uh, yeah, I think there's another four more Spark ones. Yeah. We've got two tomorrow, um, so definitely tune in for those one about uh, service design and one about influencing uh, people. So definitely tune in. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thanks very much, guys. I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. Like I said, there's lots more sessions happening with BGSS and Spark. So do check out our websites and we'll see you all soon. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks. Thanks.